Two years ago, I was watching a video on motorcyclists transversing Chile. You might be wondering what that has to do with quilting. Well, coincidentally, I was also reading the book The Long Petal of the Sea by uh, Isabella Allende, which made me ask the question, are there any Chilean quilters out there? And a Google search led me to the stories of the Arparellas, small textile pieces that were created by women who suffered under Pinochet, which led me to my next guest, Dr. Jacqueline Adams. She is the author of the book Art Against Dictatorship, which discussed how these Arparellas, made by some of Chile's least powerful citizens, were an avenue of resistance against their oppressive government. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here is my interview with Jacqueline Adams. Thank you, Jacqueline, so much for being on the show. I understand you're coming to us from Berkeley in California? Yes. I detect an accent. Are you originally from California? Sorry, no, I'm not. I'm from uh, half Chilean and half British. Uh, but I grew up in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, I went to an international school, which was English, mostly English speaking. So how many languages do you speak? I speak five. Wow. <laughs> I can barely speak one. <laughs> I'm always very impressed. It's easier when, you know, you have parents from different countries. And when you grew up in a third country, um, that, that certainly helps when you're starting off. And then once you speak a few, it's easier to acquire more. So... So you're a professor at Berkeley in the Institute of Societal Studies. Well, what... Actually, no, I'm sorry. That was the, I, so I've moved on from there. Okay. Uh, and I'm I'm a I'm what's called a project scientist. So I, I'm a researcher, full time researcher. I do a little bit of teaching as well, uh, but basically full time research. So I'm called a project scientist, and I'm in the Center for Jewish Studies at Berkeley. The Center for Jewish Studies is an interdisciplinary center that uh, has within it sociologists like me and historians and uh, people from literature, comparative literature, and several other disciplines. And uh, we share in common an interest in matters Jewish, be they history or contemporary matters, philosophical, literary. It's a really wonderful, stimulating center. So what is your main area of interest or research? Well, basically, my broad interest is how people cope with persecution. How do they cope with oppressive governments? And currently, I'm working on refugees from Nazi persecution. So uh, folks from all over Europe who were Jewish and who escaped the persecution that they were experiencing by going over the Pyrenees Mountains, which separate France from Spain. So fleeing France into Spain, which was run by another dictator, General Franco. But previously, and I think this is what you're mainly interested in, I have been working on people who were experiencing repression and persecution and who stayed put, who stayed in the country where they were experiencing that. So therefore I concentrated on Chile. I was interested in Chile, and I concentrated on the dictatorship in Chile of General Pinochet, uh, who was a dictator in the 70s and 80s there. Uh, I was very interested in the work of women of different kinds, but most of them were impoverished women in shanty towns, and their efforts to uh, survive economically by producing artwork, and also the artwork was political, so it contained scenes like, like this. Um, this is the scene of women who are protesting through song, who are singing political songs and dance that had great meaning politically that many people would have understood. So that's what I do. Well, last year, while I was just on a Google search of Chile and quilting, I came ac across the I just want to make sure I get the pronunciation right. Are Perellas? Yes. So what I've just shown you is an ad piera. Uh, it's it's uh, difficult to pronounce. So it's ar piera, ar pieras. That was this the artwork that women, various groups that became leftist anti-dictatorship groups, most women were just trying to survive poverty. This was a way they could do it because they could sell this work and receive good money for it. Many of their husbands were unemployed, 
and they lived in shanty towns, so they were in extremely difficult economic conditions. But in the process, they became politicized. They became aware, were experiencing violations of their human rights, and that their adpieras did have political content. They showed people suffering, people's poverty, what people were doing about it, and they showed other groups and the women themselves protesting. A direct translation of that, a quilt? No. The word used even in English now is abiras because it's the only word we have for this art form. But the literal word, if you looked in, in a dictionary, the word meant originally burlap, burlap, because the backs of these works was essentially sacking. Now, this one is not really like that, but the original backs of the works, this is the back of what I just showed you, was sacking. This is what it's supposed to have come from. But now the word at Pieda is, there is no exact translation because the technique is a bit different from quilting. There are different contradictory reports about how it was inspired. And one story is that it was partly inspired by American quilting. The technique used in the at Pieras is called applique, applique. We couldn't really call them quilts but they are cloth-based and they are inspired partly by American quilting, but also partly by, this is a commercial item I bought at an airport in Panama because it is the same story that says, it's only one version of how they were inspired, says that they were inspired by Panamanian mola. There's another kind of applique. This is a cloth picture, a commercial version of what at the time were beginning to become tourist objects. The, the molas were these artworks from Panama, from the islands of San Blas in Panama. But that's only one version of how the Ad Pieda came about. Um, the version that I'm more inclined to believe says that it was a woman in a neighborhood in Palo Alto, lower middle class, working class neighborhood in Chile, started to create these artworks. It spread from there. So it spread to other groups that she was in contact with, her group first, then other groups. And then it was picked up by institution, protected by the Catholic Church, but it was ecumenical to begin with. And it was helping the impoverished. And it started to buy these works and to also help other groups learn how to make them so they too could sell them. So when they were selling them, were they selling them to other Chileans or were they yeah. being exported to other countries? Yes. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the bulk was exported. It, it was exported secretly. So the word I used in my book, which I regret using, actually, is exported because smuggled out of the country is more accurate. Smuggled. So essentially, they were sold abroad and they were sent to people who were sympathetic. You see, the goal wasn't to earn a whole packet of money. The goal was not profit. The goal from the exporting institutions uh, perspective, this, this ecumenical institution, which was called originally the Comité Pro Pass, the Pro Peace Commission, and later it was it became the Vicar Vicariate of Solidarity, the Vicaria de la Solidaridad. Its goal was primarily to help these impoverished women and families, right? And the messages, remember, were dissident political messages. These messages in the Adbiera showing groups protesting, etc. So they had to send them out to people who were going to help them, who were sympathetic, who were not Pinochet, not dictatorship supporters. So they sent them to refugees. Chilean refugees had begun to leave the country, either kicked out or left of their own volition. And they sent them to them, first of all, and then also to people abroad. This is in Europe and Canada mainly, but also in Latin America, places like Cuba. They also sent them to humanitarian locals, so Europeans who wanted to help, who were sympathetic with what was happening to impoverished and persecuted Chileans and who wanted to help. These folks in foreign in countries outside Chile uh, set up market stands or uh, Christmas markets or what they called, what one of them called a, fair, a third world market. These sorts of fairs that brought together non-profits, 
churches after mass at Chilean Chilean refugee cultural events like a concert. You know, Chilean Chilean refugees are very active organizing concerts where they sang political music and talked about the situation. So at these many venues, these artworks, the Adbiedas, were sold by refugees, locals who were Europeans or Canadians or um, other folks, even in Australia, who wanted to help Chileans. This included Amnesty International members, but also members of small human rights-oriented groups and also trade unions. They were sold via this network of sympathetic folks. It was what I call a solidarity network because no one's goal was to earn money. Everyone wanted to get the money back to the women who were making the art. Now, the women that were making the art, did they come with these skills of applique and um, art, or were these things that were taught? A bit of both. So uh, mostly it was taught, but some of them, they all knew how to sew. This is a skill that they all had. They didn't tend to know how to make this form of applique, and they learned this. So they learned this because the main organization, let's say, because there were others, but the main one that was smuggling them out of the country did send some experienced at Bieda makers to people, women who wanted to form a new group, and they would teach them how. Uh, so there was another group that started that was just relatives of political dissidents who disappeared, who'd never been heard of again, who were essentially kidnapped and never heard of again. And this group also sent its own members to new groups who wanted to start making at Pegidas. Essentially, they used a lot of times their own clothing, old clothing, including sweaters that they unraveled for wool because the sewing is with wool. Those were the resources they had to make these works. They sewed mostly alone at home, but once a week, they met for about three hours. Where could they meet? It was dangerous to meet. So they asked their local priest, can you lend us a room in, in, your ch in our church? They tended to know the priest quite well. Many, many priests, not everyone, but many priests were sympathetic. And they lent them a room. And they even facilitated contact with the vicaria and sometimes initiated contact. That's what was going on. Now, when you use terms like shantytown and that, we have a tendency to think like really third world. But... Chile in the 1970s was quite a modern country. Yes, that's true. Most of the women were women who lived in shanty towns. The description of shanty town, it, they really did start as, you know, houses of cardboard with some corrugated iron. That's how they started. And some of them started this way in the 60s and 70s. And some of them, on the other hand, started as buildings built by a social project of the government. So very basic, essentially small, small homes, really basic. They were called midiawas. In some cases, they were land seizers. You know, desperately poor individuals needed places to live of their own. And they knew there was this plot here that wasn't being used and they would inhabit it. And some of them got kicked off and some of them could stay. By the 70s, these places where the women lived were no longer like what you, like this. So you're quite right to point this out. The word in Spanish where they lived and still today where they live is poblacion, neighborhoods of small brick houses now. And back then, too, for example, with perhaps two rooms, maybe a third room that they would build in the patio, a tiny area of land they had, basically the entrance to their house. And there'd be several family members living there. It, initially, these poblaciones didn't have running water and electricity. And many of the adpilleras show women lining up in the neighborhood with buckets at the only tap, the only tap in the vicinity. And they also, as I said, didn't have electricity. There were poles, there were te telegraph poles, electricity poles. And many adpilleras show individuals, men on ladders, illegally hooking up their house the one you know um, electric wire that ran through the neighborhood and so there really was a serious problem with lack of infrastructure there is no exact word for población and that's why I use the word shanty town which is the closest because also you know in Brazil we talk of favelas but favelas now are also, many of them, brick houses. 
that used to be essentially very, very rudimentary accommodation. But over the years, people try and improve their where they live. And in Brazil, we use the word favelas, and we still use this word in English. In Chile, the word is población, which we don't yet have a common usage for in English because it varies from country to country. Most Americans and Canadians are exposure to what was going on with Pinochet is through the movie Missing. Now, these women who were making these arparellas, were they victims? Like, were their husbands and their sons disappeared? There were two groups whose husbands and sons were disappeared. So two groups, each of about 20 women. The other probably 500 women were not. They were suffering from the fact that their husbands were unemployed. They were trying various means of earning an income themselves, including setting up a laundry cooperative to take in laundry for profit. And they had various means of subsistence that involved getting together with other women and cooking for the whole neighborhood by begging for food in markets. Uh, These were the problems of the vast majority of Adbiera makers. And their members thought it was important to also set up a group in a población, in a shanty town, that would be a mixed group. They called it their mixed group, Grupo Mixto. Some of them, a small number of these relatives of disappeared, were working with women who were just suffering the poverty that I'm describing. And they thought it was important to set up mixed groups to talk about their problem. But they said, I've only heard of in the interviews one mixed group in the south of Santiago where uh, one of the women essentially went to this group and set it up and they would talk about political, what had happened to them. So the dissidents resulting in a disappearance. Many shanty towns, but not all, were considered places of harboring leftists and leftist resistance. So shanty towns experienced persecution. They did. But um, there was a difference between what I call the more generalized persecution and specifically targeting the family of a dissident. There were different sorts of expressions of persecution. They did fear. They feared repression. They feared tanks coming into their shanty town. They feared soldiers conducting raids, which soldiers did on homes in in whole neighborhoods of shanty towns. Unless they had a, a, a family member who was involved in leftist underground activities, they, they might fear disappearance, but it didn't touch them necessarily. Now, did different styles of art develop with the different groups? Yes, so they did. Uh, So, for example, the artworks by the group that was the relatives of the disappeared never evolved through small three-dimensional figures. So I'll show you what I mean. I have here, this is a very, this is a Nadia of the kind that the impoverished shanty town women started to do. Now, this is a late one. This is from 1996. But you see these small figures here, these small runners, runners, unfortunately. But you see these small three-dimensional figures here? Yeah. Uh, They were called Los Monos. I I, I had one group whom I was observing make monos, and they're not very easy to make. This is the way the artwork developed in these Sagittarian groups. You know, they're quite different from this style with the flat figures that were larger that were more typical of, for example, the relatives of the disappeared. You know, the one I showed you earlier, you see it's very different. The, there's no background of mountains and, uh, and um, the, the mountains being the Andes. There's no dry sun, mountains and earth, which were the basics of the shanty town at Bieras. So that, that was one difference. And this is the beginning of making this. It, this is an unfinished one, so there's no burlap. He's done the sky and the black ground. This is the artist Ava Ocaranza Lopez, Ava Ocaranza from Southern Santiago. Um, and you can see she hasn't put the figures in yet, but this was this is a very standard format. Uh, you have houses, trees, mountains, sky, and a a political usually political content, but you have to be able to read them to pick it up. When did they turn into being called conflict textiles? Well, I've never used the word conflict textiles. I think what you're getting at, though, is 
when do they become dissident, perhaps? They wanted to earn some money. It was partly the vicaria, the Comité Propas and the vicaria, who had a unit specialised in Adbieras, who told the women to create scenes of their daily life, who started to sort of direct what they did. So, for example, um, the vicaria started to teach the women about human rights. What's human rights? And you have human rights, was a message they communicated, and your rights are being violated. And we'd like you to illustrate this in your artworks, because when we send them abroad, people want to know about this. They gave the groups copies with a list of human rights, 10 kinds of human rights. So it was, it was not at all that the women started off wanting to protest through art. Not at all. The women were meeting every week for three hours a week. They didn't have many other occasions in which to talk for an extended period with other women in the neighborhood. And they started to realize, well, my husband's also unemployed. Yes, and so's mine, and so's mine. And why are they unemployed? Well, they're unemployed, and they started to analyze. And there was a bit of a bit of input from the vicaria, which started to organize workshops where they talked to the women about the situation in Chile. They called these jornadas. They were almost day-long workshops, which were essentially discussion groups about rights and rights being violated. So the women started to develop a consciousness of themselves as people who were suffering because of the policies of the regime. And they started to learn about re repression going on, for acts of persecution going on, because they lived, they were not learning these things from any form of media. You know, there was censorship in the press, etc. But they were learning from other women. That made them want to produce also works that said what they were experiencing, their poverty, their coping strategies, you know, these soup kitchens and other wonderful and admirable coping strategies with incredible initiative they developed. They, in the process, realized we're actually also messengers sending these messages abroad. You know, the vicaria is smuggling our works out of the country. And they thought of themselves, one of them used the term, one of them from La Victoria, one of Ch Ch Santiago's Poblaciones used the term, we are journalists. We are journalists to the outside world saying what the situation is really like in Chile. So that's that's how it happened. That's how the process occurred of becoming essentially dissident artists from not intending at the start to be dissident artists. The vicaria was pushing them in. What was their agenda? Basically, the vicaria were anti-regime, anti-dictatorship organization. And um, they weren't overtly so. The vicaria was, was forced to close down its doors because it was seen by the regime as submersed, subversive. It became part of the Catholic Church because the Cardinal of Santiago, Raúl Silva Enríquez, realized that this was the only way to afford it protection, to incorporate it legally as part of the Catholic Church. So you know, he couldn't overtly say this is a protest organization within the church. He couldn't do that because he had to maintain some sort of working relationship with Pinochet. But uh, essentially all members of the vicaria were, there were leftists, there were lawyers who'd been fired from their jobs because they were leftists. There were social workers, maybe two doctors, and those were the main staff. So they were, they were professionals who had had to leave, in some cases, a university job as well, and had become active in this organization, helping the impoverished, essentially. And they also, by the way, helped Chileans who were being persecuted. They helped them get out of the country. These Chileans, whom they helped get out of the country before they were locked up and sent to jail or disappeared, became the very same people who helped the Adbiera makers by selling Adbieras, you see? They were the people the vicaria could then reach out to. The refugees wanted to help. They didn't want to give up the struggle just because they were abroad. And so, um, so the vicaria was helping the dissidents and the suffering impoverished of Chile. So, um, yeah. Have you found that this example or... Are there other examples of this dissident artwork around the world empowering people against dictatorships? 
Well, uh, yes, I think there are. So in uh, Peru, for example, the women started to copy the Chilean Adbilleras. In fact, the Chilean women, some of them I spoke to were, were a bit annoyed about this and um, looked down on, when I brought them an example, looked down on the quality. But their artworks never became really expressing dissidents. They tended to be rather, you know, showing rural scenes quite often. And there the were groups that did show urban poverty, but for the most part, it wasn't dissident art. But these artworks, these Chilean adbiedas, were displayed by the UN in Nairobi. Uh, sometime in, I believe, the 80s, and groups of women, impoverished groups of women there, took it up and started to create art forms that were based on that technique and that expressed their dis dissatisfactions with their existence. So Bolivia also started to produce adbilleras. And so it didn't spread as much as one would expect in terms of the more overt political content, but the technique spread in terms of a way of, of earning an income for low-income women in neighborhoods. Interestingly, the Adbiedas were starting to be made with very political content by exiles, Chilean exiles in Europe. So a group in Sweden, in Malmö, a city not far from Stockholm, smaller city, and they started to make uh, Adbiedas about the regime of Salvador Allende, who was the previous democratically elected president of Chile, and about his the good programs that he had to help the poor, and, and about their exile, their having had their own groups having had to leave Chile, and um, the situation in Chile. And then I also interviewed uh, ind an individual, a man who was exiled to Canada, Chilean, and he was producing ad piedras as well, um, but mainly for the purpose of surviving economically and with less political content. Uh, so it, it did spread, uh, but with different content in different places. So how did you come to be part of this uh, research? Uh, I wanted to do a project, research project, on the ad piedras for my PhD dissertation. And this was the subject of my PhD dissertation, which was focused on the ways the women in the groups became radicalized. So the women's development of themselves, a concept of themselves as having human rights and being leftist, and also, which I didn't mention before, having rights as women. So they came to understand women's rights. And so I, I started the research because my mother is Chilean. And ironically, uh, she wasn't involved in leftist activism uh, in Europe. When I say that, I mean Chilean leftist groups that were active in Europe throughout the dictatorship. And nor was she a refugee. She'd left earlier before that. In uh, She left Chile in 65 because she was in love with my father. <laughs> and so essentially, uh, I, I wanted to learn more about Chile. I was, I was very interested in Chile. After I finished my undergraduate degree, I worked there as a freelance researcher, essentially, and research assistant with UNICEF and the main UN headquarters called CIPAL and the ILO, the International Labour Organization's group called PREALC. And I was working in a, in a middle-class neighborhood with middle-class colleagues, and I was living in a middle-class neighborhood. And one day, someone walked into my office in UNICEF. He was from a, non a nonprofit that helped in some way inhabitants enduring poverty in shanty towns, in poblaciones. And I got to know him a bit through our meeting with my boss, and then I, I was very interested in this world of the shanty towns, which was totally segregated. It was another part of the city. I'd never been there, etc. And he said, do you want to come and see a shanty town? We want to come to La Victoria. But that very afternoon, I have to work by bus to La Victoria. And he showed me around a little bit. And he showed me a place where a priest was shot because the priest was helping impoverished locals and um, a stray bullet had shot him by accident while the military were in there. And that was really a bit of a transformative moment. I wanted to learn about this side of Chile that was a very large part of Chile and that was so totally divorced from the middle class 
world of um, my colleagues and, and my friends and certainly my relatives. The two, sub, two times I could take something outside my main undergraduate degree, which was in literature, I took a course that, that was about two courses about history of art. I've always been very interested in art. So, so that's how it happened. So are you yourself a handcrafter at all, a knitter or a quilter or a... Yeah, I'm afraid I'm not. Uh, when I was a child, my English grandmother uh, was a very, very accomplished and prolific crochet maker. And she taught me how to crochet. And I got really into it for about two years. I would I, I learned from her and I made things. But um, then, unfortunately, you know, I was very interested in, in, in other things. My work at school actually interested me, a lot of it. And so I that got left behind. Are you a collector of textiles? So, yes, I am. I uh, So I have a few at Bielas, I'm happy to say. I'm drawn to things, to textiles. I like quilts very, very much. And I have a couple of quilts, including one from the 1920s. And I have some uh, very old Chinese embroidery as well. So are you finding a textile connection in your current research? Unfortunately not. Uh, there is no textile connection. I am very interested in art produced by refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe. And there has been a little bit of art produced uh, in, very interestingly, in a French uh, camp where they were interned. And But uh, it was difficult for refugees to take much with them. You know, when you're in flight, changing countries, um, fleeing, you want to travel light, you've traveled over the Pyrenees mountains in many cases, you've walked over them. So very little from that period has survived, unfortunately. But yes, the, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC does have different kinds of artworks from Jews who were persecuted in different contexts. And it's very interesting and it really worthwhile if you can view those. I actually live very close to the Holocaust Center in Toronto, and having come just come back from a trip to Holland and looking at World War II museums, and there was, of course, one of the the striped pajamas or whatever. I'm not sure if there's an official name for the the camp uniforms, but realizing, oh, there is a textile connection here, and I should be getting to that museum. And talking to people. You could uh, search the website of the Holocaust Memorial Museum before you go and probably find things in their archive, which you could also visit, definitely. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to speak to me and my viewers. If people want to get a hold of you for whatever reason, how do they get in contact with you? Well, they're welcome to email me. Um, so it's Jacqueline, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E dot Adams, A-D-A-M-S at berkeley dot E-D-U. And but I'd like to say thank you so much to you, Karen, for your interest in my work, in talking about it with me and for making it uh, something that viewers might be interested in as well. And it's really been a pleasure. And I, I've enjoyed answering your questions. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Jacqueline Adams. Much has changed in the world since I started researching this topic two years ago. Learning about the Arparellistas reminds me how textiles can be an effective way of using your voice against injustice. Dr. Adams has written two books, and I'll leave their details in the description notes below, as well as their contact information. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Kate McIver of The Confident Stitch. You've seen Kate before in my Quilt Coat series, and she loves helping quilters and sewists find their perfect fit. You don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting and amazing people on this show. Let one inspire you. And check out my last video on what to gift the quilter in your life. Take care, and I'll see you next time.